Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. Today's topic is going to be the history of the wine trade. So what I'm going to try to discuss with you is um, the uh, what can affect the wine trade, how we know what we know about the history of the wine trade, who was buying, and what legislation was kind of put in place in order to protect both the buyers and the sellers. So first we'll start off with how we know what we know. Well, there's tons of information, um, especially about the medieval wine trade. Now we have from wine towns, um, towns that produced wine, we have municipal archives, public records, charters, then we have um, brokerage evidence and um, archaeological evidence, we have customs accounts and town accounts, law codes and um, port tariff codes and all kinds of fun things to look at. Um, one interesting thing, and I'm wondering if I can find it really fast, I think I can. There we go. Um, I mentioned archaeological evidence. Now a lot of this archaeological evidence is underground. So it's actually in the ocean and this is a photo of um, a diver that's going down to extract amphora from underneath the ocean from shipwrecks. So that's a lot of how we know based on the distribution of different amphora. That's how we can tell kind of who is trading with whom because a lot of, here I'll show you, there's one other good picture in here. Um, a lot of the jars that they used, the amphora, we can date them. So here if you can see, um, these slightly different amphora were from different time periods. And, and a lot of times uh, places would have very distinctive amphora that only they would uh, make. And in that, so it would be in a certain style of a certain place. So if you found that, whoa, way over somewhere else, you would know that those two um, people were trading. So that's kind of interesting. Um, then we have um, an interesting thing to look at is what could affect the wine trade. So we have a lot of different things that can affect the wine trade. Some of them obvious, some of them less obvious. So we'll start off with military action. Now military action had possibly the biggest effect on the wine trade. So if a an army um, led a conquest to a certain area, they needed wine. They needed wine and they would bring vines with them and um, and they would trade for wine, and, and that just really gave a huge spike to wine trade in certain areas. Um, then we have the movement of settlers. So if a settler was living in one place and then moved to another, they would still want a lot of the same conveniences that they had, and that includes trading for wine. Um, an interesting one is religious missionaries. So this seems kind of obvious if you're thinking about Christian and Jewish peoples moving because that's a big part of the religion. But Muslim uh, people are actually banned from drinking wine. But there's an interesting essay that discusses the effect of Muslim conquest on the wine trade. And really, it, it didn't matter as much as um, it didn't kind of affect the wine trade as much as people would think. Because it might be illegal to drink wine, but it's not illegal to grow grapes, and so people could grow the grapes and either make them into wine a bit illegally and trade it, or kind of just trade out the grapes. Now, there were certain rulers in certain areas that were a lot more strict about this, and in those times and in those areas, you would definitely have the production of larger seedless grapes, which were definitely known for eating. Um, but sometimes wine was produced out of those, which produced like a kind of um, sweeter, um, kind of more watery wine. And, and But the wine trade was not lost completely, uh, which is really lovely. Then we have um, urbanism. So people would generally have had on their land a couple of vines and they would create the wine if they lived on a farm, which pretty much everyone did um, before urbanism and they would be able to create wine just for themselves. It was not a big production, it was just a little bit just so they could have it themselves. Now, urbanism was a huge part of the Middle Ages and when people moved into the city, they obviously didn't have the land. How many people in New York City have the land to actually be 
growing wine, nobody. So they had to trade for it. And that kind of was the um, blossoming of the vintner. And that way there was one person or, well, a couple of people, but somebody that specialized in this and was able to trade it to people in the city for the things that they made. And um, this kind of developed specializations. So people were able to specialize in sweet wines or dry wines and things like that. So kind of a cool... Um, moment in wine. Then a really important thing is um, political alliances, political climate in general. So if a king was particularly interested in making money for his area, um, for his kingdom, he would definitely be interested in legislation for wine trade. This is because wine trade made a lot of money um, and there were a lot of kind of uh, system set up to definitely make it worth the king's while and um, so the political alliances definitely helped and as I talked about um, military action if kingdoms were at peace with one another then trade would flourish and different kings could kind of make deals with each other so all of these things kind of went into affecting the wine trade now when you look at wine trade you think of okay we have two groups we have the buyers and the sellers so who are the buyers now these have been broken up into four main categories so at the top as always you have the king the king so the king wouldn't just be buying for his castles and his household he would also be buying for the royal army which is kind of cool royal army got a lot of wine back then um and then you had barons. Now this was kind of, this level was more about the, how shall we put it, the entertainment of the feudal lords. Um, so people having parties and entertaining people. Um, then you have the church, and the church bought wine for their monasteries. So obviously wine is a part of church proceedings. Um, and for the bishops and the abbeys. And then way down at the bottom, you had the commoners. And the commoners would actually be buying their wine um, from town taverns. Now, it's really interesting to figure out because there was a lot of legislation set up surrounding the wine trade, and a good amount of it was designed to protect the commoners in the taverns. And I think that's really forward thinking. I think that's kind of great. Um, so in general for legislation, there were two branches, we'll say. So one was protection, like we spoke about, but it didn't just protect, um, the buyers, they protected the sellers as well. And then we have regulation. So in terms of protection, like I mentioned, you can protect the buyer and the seller and legislation in the middle ages did both. So first of all, we had something called crown set prices. Now this kind of troubles me as somebody who wants to protect quality wine. Um, the crown could simply say, okay, all wine under my reign is like $5 a cup. Well, that's not enticing anybody to try anything new or make great wine. But of course, that was not necessarily the goal at that point. So I understand that. Um, but still, that's an interesting thing that the crown was able to do. They had a lot of control over the wine industry because it was a huge industry. Um, then we have this concept of just price. Now, this is something that's written about in nearly every history of wine trade book. Um, the theory of just price was really important to people and it had to do with popular morality and Christian theology. This idea that it was shameful, like shame on you if you were going to be making a profit off of this wine. You know, you could uh, make enough to feed your family, whatever, if you were a, um, a vintner, but don't go trying to make thousands of dollars back then, um, off of a bottle, that that is shameful and that's not okay. So there was a lot of regulation of prices, which included the king sending out tasters to taste the wine and then to create fair prices for it. So somebody would drink the wine and then say, okay, I think that this wine is worth blank um, per blank. So per barrel or per whatever um, instance they were selling it in. Kind of interesting. And a very important aspect was that the customer had to always be able to see um, 
the wine coming out of the barrel. So for instance, in ancient Greece, they had a law that all the jars of wine that were sold had to be sealed, sealed completely. They could not be opened in any way because they were so afraid of adulteration of wine. And this carried through into the Middle Ages. And I actually have a poem by Chaucer. Um, and I'll just read you a couple of lines because it, it explains how incredibly common it was that there was an adulteration of wine and people knew about it. So we have, um, that wine mysteriously finds its way to mix itself with others, shall we say, spontaneously, that grow in neighboring regions. Out of the mixture fumes arise in legions. So people were definitely aware that this was going on and they weren't happy about it. And we actually have an ordinance, which I posted on Twitter. If you are not following me, go follow. Um, and if you are, I hope you got to look at this. This is written in Old English, so it's a bit dense, but it is the Ordinance Against the Adulteration of Wine from 1419. And it talks about, um, uh, do not meddle foreign color, um, no white with red, no old with new, just like non-vintage wine, so I find that kind of funny. Um, no whole with broken and no corrupt. So there was definitely this acknowledgement that people were mixing inferior wine with superior wine and then charging superior prices. And aside from the people who were selling it, nobody was okay with that. Now, it's not all bad. Um, the, the sellers are not all bad, and they actually, um, in terms of the legislation on their side, they took matters into their own hands, and they created something called a Vintner's Guild. Now, the Vintner's Guild worked to work together and advocate for fair prices. Okay, we're not going to charge you a ton. We're going to try to make sure that the tavern owners don't mix the wine, but you got to meet us halfway. And this was kind of an advocacy group for them um, that made sure that they were protected from unfair competition. So now we have the, um, that was the protection side, and now on legislation we have the regulation side. So regulation was a huge part of the medieval wine trade, um, of all wine trade, because taxation was so key. Um, so you had the um, port tariff charges, you had freight charges on the sea, um, near the coast, <laughs> there were so many ways to tax you, carriage tax ride, um, car carriage uh, taxes and charges, um, and then you had maritime laws, and the reason why a lot of these oceanic um, ordeals, a lot of these kind of maritime laws and, and um, port tariffs were so important was because most wine was just traveling over the sea. And there's an interesting, and I'm hoping it's in this book right here, which I have in my lap. Um, okay, for instance, the main European wine trade routes. Now I'm going to hold this up and hope that you can see it on my post-it notes. Um, and if you can, which I'm pretty sure that you can, you will see that pretty much all of the trade routes were along rivers, were along um, oceans, and that's actually pretty lucky for us because what that means is that we have a lot of um, documentation, like I talked about the um, port tariffs and things like that, so when something came into a port, it was logged, and there's a ton of shipwrecks, and so because of that, we have um, like things like this where uh, the shipwrecks would completely go down and all of the wine would kind of be trapped in there. And there was actually a very cool thing, and I had a picture of it here ready for you on my computer. Let's see if my computer turns on. Okay. Um, and this is called a Dolia. And this is a ship that was completely made entirely in order to ship amphora. And so, as you can see, um, this was not a passenger ship, this was not a regular cargo ship, this is a ship specifically designed just to transport wine. So it tells you how important wine was um, in the sea trade at the time. I'm just trying to think if I have any other important things. Oh, and for the tariffs, 
I have this interesting little document here, and this is from Studies in the Medieval Wine Trade, edited by E. M. Veal. And this uh, are, let's see, we have coast-wise freight charges for wine. So I don't know if you'll actually be able to see this, but this is what a lot of the documentation that we look at looks like. And it, in general, has to do with um, the information that they take down is, for instance, the date. So exactly what time did this arrive? Where did it pass? Where did it originate? Where did it pass through? Where did it end up? And then they charge taxes per ton. So a lot of kind of advanced stuff happening and, and very impressive, very um, interesting trade routes and interesting trade taxation and legislation. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a lot. Um, it was pretty jam-packed. And I will see you next week. Cheers.